Howdy, fellow Kerbinauts. Rice here. We're back again at Kerbal Space Program, and I gotta level with ya. I think it's time for another gosh darn space shuttle series. Why another space shuttle series? Well, because I love space shuttles. And chances are you're watching this because you love shuttles too. So, here it is. Episode 1 of the Mini Shuttle Program. Inspired by Sierra Nevada Corporation's space plane program, the Dreamcatcher, as well as its surface to space launch system. Now for this series, we're gonna take things up a notch, which means that everything we send up into space has to fit inside those B9 cargo bays. And I'm not talking about the big ones, I'm talking about the smaller standard size ones that you see on this shuttle. Which means that we're pretty much stuck bringing things up into space that are about one meter in size, 1.25 meters, or we might be able to fit the 1.8 size meter parts that are custom with a lot of mods but other than that chances are we're not going to be bringing a whole lot of two meter parts into space since most likely they don't fit inside those cargo bays so what does this mean well it means things are going to be a whole lot lighter and things are going to be a whole lot smaller and to help herald that today for this episode and also for the next couple episodes, we will be building a mock-up of the International Space Station using mostly one meter parts. And I've got to tell you, I am on a mission. Most Kerbal Space Program videos that you see out there where folks are building the International Space Station or a replica or, or something that looks pretty similar to the ISS usually end up building it in a huge number of parts. We're talking on the order of something like between 300 to 500 parts and using ginormous pieces, 2.5 meter parts and, hot and larger. So my quest here being a Kerbal Space Program minimalist and true to the minimalist spirit is that we are gonna build the International Space Station with much fewer parts. And by the mock-up models that I put together here for the ISS, it's going to be at least less than 130 parts, and we are going to be using mostly 1 meter parts without any of the standard size 2.5 meter parts. So we have quite a big challenge ahead of us because it has to fit inside that little cargo bay in there, but it's totally doable, which you will see in the next couple episodes. And now, let's talk about our shuttle. Composed of just 29 parts and weighing in at a fairly light 9.8 tons when empty, this light shuttle can carry a hefty weight of 5 tons into low carbon orbit. Now with that said, we've got quite a bit of a challenge ahead of us. Our mission is to build something that looks like the International Space Station. We have to build it 5 tons at a time and we have to keep it under 130 parts. Is it doable? Absolutely! And we are going to be doing this in true minimalist fashion with the use of this space shuttle. Now as you probably noticed, almost every component of this light shuttle is designed to be reusable. You probably saw the solid rocket motors jettison with the parachutes. Well, same thing with the, the launch portion of this vehicle as well. Uh, the launcher is also designed to be uh, reusable in that it returns back to carbon heat shield and all, well, <laughs> at some point we end up discarding the heat shield, but all the other parts of uh, this launch booster are uh, reusable. So I imagine this certainly helps with the cost of uh, the space program and refurbishing our shuttle for reuse for constructing our space station. Now, as you can see, we opened up our parachutes there, coming in for a fairly decent landing. Um... I probably should have kept that heat shield on because I jettisoned that guy and it's kind of hanging canterwise. But other than that, uh, we managed to get this booster landed safely back to Kerbin, minus the heat shield. Now we're going to go ahead and scoot along at about four times speed here while we intercept the first component of the International Space Station which is already in orbit. That is the Zarya module. Now the Zarya module uh, carried propulsion, electrical, and also guidance capabilities for the International Space Station. Now what we have nesting inside of our cargo bay is the Svezda module, 
that is going to be the second component that we will be attaching to the space station. Now, historically, the Svezda module was the third component brought up to the International Space Station, but we're going to take a few liberties for this one here. <laughs> Now the Svezda module carried life support and crew quarters for up to two whole crew members and served as the initial operations hub of the International Space Station. Now we're going to be taking a number of liberties here when constructing this station because, well, let's face it, the entire space station wasn't built with just a space shuttle. Russia had a lot of help in this one. They've used their own traditional proton rockets to launch parts and modules up into the space station, but for this one here, this is going to be all shuttle. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to have Bill pop on out here, and he's going to inspect and supervise the docking between the space shuttle and the Zarya module. Going to make sure that we got everything nice and centered and aligned. Um, as he watches, he's going to be calling out telemetry data, make sure everything looks Perfect. Now, as you can see, um, the uh, Zarya module here carries a little bit more than just power and propulsion. It also has uh, some uh, life support capabilities as well. Considering that we're using uh, mainly 1.25 meter parts, we won't have a whole lot of room for life support, which means that we're going to be using those 1.25 uh, meter components for life support pretty liberally. I know that if we didn't have these constraints, we'd be using the much larger 3.5 or 3.75 life support pods. But, uh, well, you know, constraints and all. <laughs> But here we go. Uh, we are coming in nice and easy. We are almost docked. And, oh, here we go. Coming in nice. I think the magnetics should be kicking in just a moment. And there we go. Bingo. We've got dock with the Zarya module. Next, we're going to have Bill jump into the assembly pod. And he's going to prepare to pull out the uh, second module out of the uh, cargo bay. As you can see, both the assembly module and the Svezda module are together as one single piece in the cargo bay. And as you can see, both components made for a pretty snug fit. But with a little bit of elbow grease, we managed to <laughs> catapult ourselves out into space here. Not exactly the most elegant of maneuvers. Uh, but now we're going to use our RCS thrusters to reposition ourselves here and get that Svezda module docked into the uh, main portion of the space station. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a Canada arm or some sort of uh, arm that the space shuttle used to help assemble the space station. Instead, we're going to be using another analog like the arm, which is this uh, assembly pod here. Uh, now, here we go. Going to go ahead and jet ourselves in very carefully. Now, this is where... The OCD kind of kicks in here as we try to get uh, get our rotation as close to zero degrees as possible. <laughs> and there we go. We are docked. And now that we have assembled all the major components of the space station for this mission, the ISS itself is now sitting at a whopping 32 parts with a weight of approximately 5.6 tons. And then we're going to have Bill here take the scenic route back to the space shuttle to inspect his handiwork before he comes back into the cabin. And after a few days in orbit, making sure all of the systems are working correctly on the space station, it's time for us to undock and bring our light shuttle, as well as all our crew members, back home. Now even though the space station does have crew quarters, as well as life support systems, food and water, it's not necessarily a good idea to leave crew up there just yet. It's missing one more component, and that big component that we need is some sort of KRV, a Kerbal Return Vehicle in the event of an emergency. We really don't want to end up trapping our Kerbals up there in space if uh, something happens. So here we are, coming back to the Kerbal Space Center. It's been a while since I've landed a shuttle back uh, from space uh, during previous episodes and also in my own personal playthroughs. I've gotten used to messing around with rockets, so it's been a while since I've played around with shuttles. But this time, it's a chance for me to get back into the swing of things and uh, knock off a bit of rust from my uh, shuttle landing skills and uh, see if I still got what it takes to uh, land this thing properly at the Kerbal Space Center. 
<laughs> now every now and then I sometimes shortchange myself and I end up landing just short of the runway, uh, but sometimes I manage to pull off uh, some pretty good skills every now and then and manage to hit the runway dead on. Hopefully um, I'll be able to do just the same here <laughs> as I have during uh, previous episodes. I've marked the uh, beginning of the runway uh, with uh, one of those markers so that I get, can get a good uh, telemetry distance from the runway. Coming in nice and easy here. Wheels have contacted the runway and Drogue shoot out and... Okay. <laughs> Nailed it! <laughs> Oh, Jeb and Bill don't look terribly happy about the landing, but at least they're back home alive, uh, if minus one wing. Well, thank you everybody for joining me this episode. I declare this mission mission complete, and we will see you next time.